Glad that you're here this morning. We will get into our study of John 2 in just a moment. Before we do, if you will bow with me and let's start off in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we are so filled with joy this morning at the opportunity to address you as our Father. We thank you for the many good things that you have blessed us with in this life. We are so richly and, and abundantly provided for. Help us to be good stewards of those things. Help us to recognize that life is, is more than food, that, that the body is more than clothing, that we are to be living sacrifices to You, that we are to use the good things in our lives in a way that will show You are our greatest treasure. Father, we, we trust You and we love You, and so we ask You to do whatever You must do to refine us and purify us and use us for Your joy and, and for Your glory. We thank You for Your Word that so powerfully ha has revealed You and Your will to us, and we pray that Your blessing would be on us as we study it this morning. Please be with all throughout this building who are teaching and, and studying. We thank You for this body and for every member who makes it up. We know that we have many members of our body who would love to be here this morning, but are dealing with ailments and, and sicknesses and weaknesses of the flesh. Please be with them. Help us to communicate to them how much we treasure them as members of this body and, and use us as as instruments of comfort and encouragement. And Father, we look forward to the day when we can gather together around Your throne where there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death, but that we will be able to enjoy pure and uninterrupted fellowship with You and Your Son and Your Spirit and all of Your people from all of the ages. We cling to our hope through Your Son we offer our prayer to you this morning through Him. Amen. Okay, John chapter 2 is where we are. And of course, we are just doing our best to chronologically walk through the life of Jesus as presented in the Gospels. I've been working on um, some written material. Don't quite have it done yet. It's rather involved. But some written material that will kind of address... Why you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke constructed the way they do, and how does the Gospel of John fit into that? John is very different, okay? It's written historically much later. It uh, doesn't have the, the parables, the short, pithy statements like we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is much more long, detailed discourses of teaching. It, it is structured in a different way. There are key miracles. There are key I am statements. And uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to pass that along to any who are interested. How you fit these together chronologically and why there are some differences and, and how we ought to view those differences. Some of the whys can't be answered, but maybe uh, that, that will continue to help as we move along. Be looking for that. Last week we were in Matthew, Mark, and Luke looking at the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. And we have really tried to zero in. I hope that you have been following along the six basic questions. Those we've made available for each week. And a lot of these, really from last week and even today, these questions hopefully bring that text to life. One of the things that... Um, uh, that, that I have encouraged you to think about. Um, how does this section of Scripture, it's question number four uh, each week, how does this section of Scripture show Jesus to be a real Savior for real people? And that speaks to what we talked about last week, right? We spent a lot of time dissecting His temptations and trying to appreciate the ultimate New Testament point that He is our high priest, yes, but He is a sympathizing high priest. 
He can empathize with our weaknesses. He was in all points tempted as we are, the Hebrew writer tells us, and yet without sin. That speaks to how Jesus is a real Savior for real people. And the same kind of thing in our week five study. We are setting wise up north in the, uh, the region of Galilee. Uh, the Jordan River flows, Dead Sea far to the south, Jerusalem where we will be in just a little while in our text, far to the south. Here is the Sea of Galilee. Jesus does a great deal of teaching and healing on the north side, particularly around the city of Capernaum. We will run across that certainly as we move along. Right now he is to the west, about 10 miles west of the Sea of Galilee in the small town of Cana. If you've got your Bibles open there, John chapter 2 and verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Remember, Jesus is now roughly 30 years old. Okay? And so the dynamics of his relationship with his mother have certainly changed. We've got a lot at the beginning. We've got the briefest of glimpses of Jesus and his interaction with his mother and Joseph at the age of 12. But really then for the next 18 years, it is largely silent. This is one of the first now adult interactions that we have Jesus and his mother. Jesus and his mother are there, and he's also invited with his disciples, according to verse 2. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, tying in with the, the common customs of, of the day with a Jewish wedding. Six stone water jars, and each of them held 20 or 30 gallons. Large stone water jars. And Jesus said to the servants in verse 7, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down geographically. We're in a mountainous area. He goes down in elevation towards Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Rest of the chapter we'll get to in a little while, talking about Jesus cleansing the temple. And we're going to talk about that even in more detail in our sermon here in just a little while. But particularly here, this, this first section. Questions abound, obviously, on, on a number of different fronts. Who is this Jesus? And how did this happen? And what does this mean? Uh, there are, are modern questions, obviously, that tie in with the nature of wine and everything. We don't quite have the, the time this morning to get back into that. I would reference uh, a CD that's available back there from just a few weeks ago where we talked about uh, alcoholic wine, the sting of the sparkling uh, serpent. It's called back there. And so as you have questions particularly about that, I would point you there. But in this story particularly, first sign that Jesus does. John is careful to, to draw that point out. Why, of all the things Jesus could possibly do as a first sign, 
Why this kind of thing? I mean, you know, later on he's going to raise the dead and he's going to walk on water. Why, as the first sign that something very special was going on, why this kind of thing, do you think? Ruby? Okay. Uh, I think this, this is really what uh, represents the, good, the better is now with Jesus Christ. Okay, kind of taking the idea that Jesus was able uh, to <clears throat> create incredibly tasty fruit of the vine. Uh, again, we won't get all into it. You can go back and you can read that um, that text. Uh, or that uh, listen to that sermon, but literally what is going on here is they have no fruit of the vine. Our English word wine can be can be tricky. In, at that point in time, it didn't necessarily mean anything alcoholic. And so what's going on here is, well, when everyone has drunk freely and had plenty of this to drink, a lot of times then you would serve what didn't taste quite as good. You know, start out with a bang kind of thing. Serve the best. But this is reversed. Jesus is able to create miraculously something that tastes very good and maybe an indicator that there have been good things in the past, but the best has arrived. In the Jewish mind, I mean, there was Abraham, there was Moses, there was Elijah, there were all of these prophets, but now something greater than those has come, maybe symbolically. Chuck, go ahead. This passage has always kind of puzzled me. Okay. And here's kind of what I come to based on your question. Number one, Jesus' mother asked him to do something. Yeah. And in essence, he says, you know, well, what does this have to do with me? In other words, I don't care to get involved with this right now. My yeah. mother's not ready. To You're going to have to wait. Yet his mother turns and says, do whatever she tells him, presuming he'll that he'll do it. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I want to say is he did it because she asked. Okay. And that may be a reflection to us and prayer that you know, whatever we ask in his name, you know, he'll do. Second point is he did this not to make a grand show of everybody there. Yeah. He says that and his disciples believe. In other words, he was confirming to those that were just around him. You know, I am the Christ. You need to pay attention to what I'm going to do from now on. Yeah. And they believe. So it confirmed just him and his disciples and their little group what happened. Okay. Uh, removing the servants out of the picture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things just to expound on the, the good comments, Ruby and, and Chuck. How does this section of Scripture show Jesus to be a real person, real Savior? You know, a lot of times when we think of Jesus, we think of the... The one who was transfigured, the one who walks on the water, the one who heals the dead, the one who is able to do tremendous, supernatural, amazing, take your breath away kind of things. Jesus goes to a wedding. I mean, he's invited and his disciples are invited and and so he goes. He's a real person. He mingles with real people. We see that from the very beginning, don't we? And we see that for the rest of his life. Yes, there are the rich and there are the elite and there are the educated and there are the movers and shakers, the politicians. And Jesus will spend time talking with them and try to encourage them to use the good influence and the good resources they have for the advancement of the kingdom. But more often than not, Jesus seems most comfortable around common people, doesn't He? Everyday, run-of-the-mill, common people whose hearts are, are, be willing, are, are, are willing to be shaped and molded. And so that, that's the first point. I mean, Jesus is invited to a joyful occasion and, and He goes. Jesus 
knew how to have a good time. He knew how to laugh. Jesus or children loved to be around him. You 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 think about the many layers of Jesus, and this is one of those very real aspects of Jesus. And so he goes, and his mother is there, and big embarrassment, right? I mean, a, a wedding feast is a big deal, and the basic staple drink has run out and the feast isn't over and there are all of these guests and so there is a certain amount of stress obviously attached to this Jesus' mother comes to him points this out and he says what does this have to do with me my hour has not yet come not the first time that we're going to run across Jesus saying that kind of thing when Jesus says my hour has not yet come what ought we to read into that I mean, we kind of touched on it a little last week with the temptations. The, the devil brings him to the very pinnacle of the temple and encourages him, just throw yourself off. It's a matter of uh, prophecy in the Psalms that God and His angels won't allow you to dash your foot against a stone. You're right here in the midst of the holy city. Just jump and show everybody who you are. And you get the, the flavor that it's not time for that kind of thing yet. And, and he says the same kind of thing here. Dave, go ahead. I, I was just going to uh, say, Jason, that you know, in his, early in his ministry, when he did a number of other miracles, not just this one, uh -huh. he told people, don't get people back. Yeah. He, his time of glorification, his time, it would come, but it was not the time. Yeah. He, was trying to, he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to make a big name for himself at that point. Yeah, it's remarkable, especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how many times Jesus will heal someone and He says, don't tell anybody about it. Or, you know, someone is raised from the dead, keep it to yourself. You know, uh, someone ha has been healed and, and go down to the temple and, and give what is due at the, the temple, pay the temple tax, pay the purific purification right uh, fees, but keep your mouth shut. A and you get the idea in the Gospels, people are so overjoyed. I mean, they're skipping and they're jumping all the way to the temple and they're telling everybody who, who is willing to listen. It's almost like Jesus' parable of the mustard seed, right? The smallest of seeds, he says, it starts out very, very small. But you give it enough time and it grows into a beautiful, tall, full, lush tree where birds of the air can come and make their nest. And he says the kingdom of heaven is like that. It starts very small. Or it starts almost unseen like a little bit of leaven in the midst of a whole lump of dough and nobody sees it and it's working quietly and slowly and methodically. But you give it enough time and you're going to get what you want to get. That's exactly the way his ministry was. It starts out very small. And the larger the crowds get, the more he asks them why. Why are you following me? You know, early on, it's to show that innermost circle, something very special is going on here. And you need to watch and you need to pay attention. What you gave up over at the Sea of Galilee when you walked away, it's worth it. Just watch. Just allow your hearts to be worked on. And eventually it's going to grow and it's going to grow and it's going to grow to thousands of people and then He's going to challenge them. Are you just here for the loaves of bread and the miraculous fish meals or do you grasp the larger point? Everybody's attracted to a show, right? I mean, a three-ring circus gets everybody's attention. But Jesus was here for more than impressing other other people, right? D, go ahead. Well, I have a question. Maybe it's, well, sure. sure. Why did he tell them not to tell this? And he, Fair question. He wanted to know if the people couldn't keep it. <coughs> yeah. He was praying about of what he had said, but he asked them not to. Why? Yeah. yeah. Good question. Any any stabs at an answer? Why would Jesus say that kind of thing, Dwayne? That it is respect for it to today. You know, we're not going to have the option or, or the, the 
availability of actually seeing one of Jesus' miracles. So we have to read about it and hear it second, third, you know, fourth hand, someone else's account. Okay. I think it's that same sort of idea that he wanted the, the masses, those that weren't going to be teaching when he first left, to, to have that faith. Okay. Hey, we're hearing this, and even though we haven't seen it, we believe it. And I, I think it's establishing early faith. Okay. okay. So maybe giving people the opportunity to see firsthand for themselves, you know, the news would continue to spread, but he wanted their faith to be their faith. That's a good stab. Go ahead and then, and then Dave. Uh, the Lord wanted God to give the glory. Okay. okay. They were glorifying him and they say, well, Jesus did it. Well, Jesus didn't do it. God did it through Jesus. Okay. Still very, very, very early on, and even the disciples of John, I mean, they know, well, John the Baptist referred to this one as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, he's able to do some amazing things. Perhaps he's a prophet. There are questions of Elijah reincarnated. But we haven't really run across someone that has said, you are the Son of God. I mean, that's going to come Matthew 16, right? With Peter. We're, we're still a long ways away from that. Where Jesus finally, now after months and months and months of, of His innermost circle seeing this, finally asks them, Who do you say that I am? And only then is Peter the first one to say, Well, you're not just the Messiah. You're not just a prophet. You're not just a miracle worker. You are the Son of God. And, and that's, that's a whole nother level. And so right now, pointing people to God, giving glory to God the Father. Dave, what were you going to say? My thought was kind of along the same line. I mean, he, he wasn't trying to do this for selfish purposes or, okay. or reason. I mean, he, he was telling people not to go to hell, but... He knew all too well human nature. He knew that they, we could go and tell. Yeah. Uh, but but he he didn't want that to be done for selfish purposes. And the book of John is all about uh, proclaiming the deity of yeah. Jesus. And we see his humanity here in in you know, wanting to not let this piece be a disaster. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think he went in there planning to do a miracle. I think there was a situation that arose and he, he saw a need and his mother insisted and, and he accommodated the situation. Yeah, yeah, good point. Alan? I believe it was fulfillment of the prophecies and I heard it. Okay, go ahead and speak up. The, the fulfillment of the prophecy and not the thing. Okay, there are a lot of Old Testament prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled and, and we're just right now getting glimpses and like Dave said it's almost like he, he didn't even go into it planning on doing it. which again identifies him as a real person who can relate to real people I, I mean his mother almost insists and he knowing that he is the son of God is willing to accommodate what does that say to you about Jesus? I mean, he says, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. The mother turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And he does it. In the, in the fact that he doesn't, you know, rebuke her or strike her with palsy or, you know, any number of things. What, what does that tell you about this Jesus we are, are, are worshiping even this morning? Go ahead. Um, I was watching the History Channel one time, and there was uh, uh, an argument out of the uh, discussion between two things. Mm -hmm. The one was talking about the deity of Jesus, and the other was, he's just a man. Okay. Just the man, you know. And he brought up the fact about how rude he was at this occasion in saying, Woman, what does this have to do with you? Uh huh. I, I was thinking at the time, read the rest of it, and you will find there was a. a, a in his time, he's always done this. He has, and, and she knows, and we know. And there are times when we might be outspoken about something and we need to have respect for people. He, he loves his mother. He respected her. 
Yeah. And, and I think that showed a good relationship at this point between the two of them in understanding. Shows that he cares. Shows that he's willing to listen. Listen. It shows compassion. It shows the willingness to even bend his will. I mean, we don't typically think about God bending his will. And yet we read in the Old Testament, Jehovah, God the Father doing that, determining he's going to just obliterate the children of Israel off the face of the earth and he's going to start over with Moses. And Moses pleads with God. He reasons with God. What will the Egyptians say? You, you just brought this people out here to destroy them. Think about the glory of your name. Don't do this. And it says, God changed his mind. That's not the only time that we read that kind of thing um, in the Old Testament. Here we've got God with us right here in the flesh. And his mother reasons with him and he does it Alan go ahead in John 19 and verse 28 yeah it says that with this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scriptures might be fulfilled said yeah. yeah at the very end of his life Lots of different layers here. There's the humanity of Jesus, the, the, the compassion, the, the everyday real person that could be touched and seen and, and who would laugh and go to weddings and, and enjoy those kinds of festive occasions. There is the, the side of Jesus who knows He has come from the Father and knows what the Father wants Him to do and knows what awaits Him three years from now in Jerusalem. He, he knows that how this is all going to end. There is the, the fulfillment aspect of this that all of these prophecies, we're going to note as we talk about the latter half of this, that the fulfillment of prophecy from Malachi chapter 3 as Jesus goes to the temple. Lots of different layers here. And so we ought not to be surprised at the conclusion of the Gospels where it's all brought to a nice little conclusion and it's almost like a bow is tied on the end of it that every single thing Jesus came to accomplish he did. Every single thing He came to fulfill, He did. He lived life with singular purpose. But He also knew how to live life among very common, everyday people. I would suggest to you we ought to take a great deal of comfort from that. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, you, know, you kind of touched on it, but here uh, I think we see an underlying motive for why He did <coughs> I and mean, we see his mother seeing this situation. It's horrible to think about having this huge wedding feast and running out of, you know, food or drink. Yeah. And uh, you know, here are all these people. Who, their weddings were different than what we think about weddings. This was this was a disaster. Yeah. And and so her compassion on the situation. She's like she knew about Jesus, her her son. Yeah. And and so. Uh, she had that compassion. Jesus had. She has faith. She had faith, and Jesus had compassion on this situation. And that's what motivated him to do all those miracles. Yeah. Like feeding the you know four thousand. You know when he fed the people, he did it because he saw he was compassionate. Yeah. Over and over and over again in the Gospels, we're going to read phrases like Jesus saw, or Jesus heard. And he felt compassion. And that moved him to do something. Okay? And again, just a closing thought for this morning. A lot of times we think about Jesus as Lord, Jesus as Judge, Jesus as Vindicator, all of those things. And, and, and that is certainly valid. We want to be balanced both ways because the scripture is balanced. Jesus is worthy of every ounce of reverence and respect and fear that we can muster. No doubt about it. But I would encourage you to keep this kind of thing in mind as well as you pray and as you think about Jesus. That, that through Him you have the opportunity to address Almighty God the Father of, of the universe and He cares. 
Okay? He cares about you just like He cares about this situation. And like Chuck said very early on, I mean, all sorts of things, you know, kind of a difficult passage that doesn't really fit our nice little black and white construct. But if nothing else, it shows He was willing to listen. He's willing to change His plans. Willing to try and accommodate. Willing to try and help. And if He was willing to do that, then we have no reason whatsoever to believe that, that He does not have that willingness and that desire to do that right now. Okay? Following that, where it, as, as it's summarized in verse 11, this is the first of His signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, manifested His glory, and right now, just, just that small pocket... His disciples believed in Him. Remember, they have spent some some days with Him. Uh, there have been some evenings. That the, the curiosity is growing. The excitement is growing. Jesus has been tempted. We're ready to kick off really the public side of this whole thing. He starts out just with that inner group. He goes over to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. He stays there for a good amount of time. Then he heads south to Jerusalem. We're going to talk about that, like I said, in our sermon period. What I would encourage you to do for next week, look in your material. It's week number six. It's John chapter three. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He begins talking with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, one of the rulers of the Jews. Jews, and it's the first substantial long section of teaching that we have from Jesus. Okay? A lot of times, I mean, you know, we think Matthew, we get to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Historically, that's going to come a little later on. Okay? That's why you don't find that until later on in our, our schedule. This is the first substantial chunk of real teaching from Jesus is John chapter 3. And so we will get into that, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. Thank you for being here. If you don't have a copy of our material, please be sure to grab that and do the reading and studying for next Sunday morning.